We let... Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. I pray everyone is doing well on today. Despite the weather, despite the obstacles, the ice and the cold. Amen. Hallelujah. I was reading and the Bible talks about how the frost comes out of the north. God is good. He's able to change the seasons, not only on the earth, but in our lives. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So thank God for seasons that change and the God that changes the seasons. Hallelujah. Well, I am excited this morning. I'm looking forward to the word of God. Um, I believe God has a word for us today, and I believe it's going to bless us as we hear what thus saith the Lord. So let's uh, get ourselves together and arrange ourselves, our minds, and all of the components that we need to so we can get ready to hear from God. I believe it's, it's, it's a blessing to be able to hear God. I, my, my, uh, I remember late Bishop Lockett used to say, your net worth increases because you can hear from God. So don't ever think you broke as long as you can hear from God. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, I feel like you're going to do something wonderful today. I just can't help it, Lord. I just sense that you're going to do something wonderful today. Just want you to know we're absolutely open to whatever you choose to do. Holy Spirit, have your way. God, you're good, and all that you do is good. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we bless the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. Amen and amen. amen. Glory to God. I just can't help but feel like it's going to be a God kind of day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I do want to make mention of this before I get started. Uh, to the Redeeming Love Word Ministries family, congratulations on 15 years of ministry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. For those of you all that may not know, this marks our 15th year of ministry. On the fourth Sunday in January in 2017, I mean 2007, we embarked upon our first physical service. We had had prayer services for the previous 30 days, literally, and to look back and see what the Lord has done in these 15 years has been a wonderful experience. I am hoping all of those that had signed up for our event that we had planned, you also got uh, noticed that due to our in inclement weather, it has been postponed to a later date. So we've postponed the actual celebration, but it's not stopping us from being able to celebrate. Amen. Amen. So I commend you on 15 years of ministry. Yeah. Amen. Now, the preliminaries, preliminaries are out of the way, so I want to speak with you today on a topic that I believe that all of us uh, will be able to relate to. If you can't right now, hopefully by the end of service, you will be able to. Um, the Bible says, if you, if you will, Job chapter 37, verse 14, Job 37 and verse 14. Bible says, hearken unto this. In other words, listen to this. Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. So the writer is capturing a bit of scripture and he's saying, listen to this, Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. We are in a time and a place in our lives where we are faced with unprecedented uh, pandemics. We have seemingly supply chain uh, mismanagements or issues, if you will, however you want to do it. We, we have the blame game going from it's this particular party, it's that particular party. Uh, people are trying to just survive. 
It is literally, you know, you know we've never take, came, come to a point in life where we see people literally say, I don't want to work. No, no, no. Cross the board. Cross society. Doctors are quitting. Nurses are quitting. Lawyers are quitting. No, this ain't just, you know, sometimes we look at it and we only see a segment. People are quitting. This morning, I want to talk to you about some very simple, the advantages of being still in the kingdom. The advantages of being still in the kingdom. Now, boy, I, I feel like I can shout and run already. I'm telling you. <clears throat> the advantages of being still in the kingdom. See, there's a lot of movement going on. A lot of movement. Things are shaking and, and transitioning and going this way and going that way. But there's some advantages to being still in the kingdom. Y'all ready? Remember the writer told Job, he said, now, I need you to listen to this. I need you to be still. And look at the wondrous works of God. Go with me to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 1. Mm -mm -mm. Holy Ghost, you are awesome. I'm just trying to try to contain all of this. Jeremiah said it was like fire shut up in my bones. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they may turn and encamp before Pahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belsavon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Well, and I, I, as we read this, let's pull a little bit so we'll be in context. Most of us are aware that this is a passage of scripture that is referring to Israel after having come up out of Egypt. They are in the first stages, if you will, of journeying towards the promised land. They are now free from Egyptian rule. They've experienced the plagues that God has released on Egypt. They have come out uh, on full. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We see, we need to understand all of that. Yeah, they're on full. Remember, we, we, they had, um, I mean, just to refresh your mind, I, I know you know the story, but if, if you recall, they have so much that they had to take their children and put clothes on them. They had to put jewelry on the kids. In other words, they couldn't carry it all, so they draping stuff on top of the kids. Coming up with all of the stuff, because the Bible says, and they spoil the Egyptians. So they're in a unique predicament here. The Bible says that they turn and encamp before Pahirath. It's interesting because they are out of Egypt, but you know how when you're traveling and you're out of the city, but you're not out of the city limits. Yeah, I'm making sure we, we understand. You, you, you out of the city in the sense of the metropolitan part of the city, but you're still within the city's jurisdiction. So they're out of Egypt, but not out of Egypt's jurisdiction. And it's really interesting because as you read this story, the Bible says something very interesting. God speaks unto, well, he tells Moses to speak unto the children of Israel, and he says that they turn. So what you have to understand is they were going in another direction. They were going in a direction that was actually putting them in a position that they would have entered into the promised land sooner. So God says, Moses Tell the children of Israel to turn now. And not just turn, but turn so they're encamped before Pahirath. Now, why are they camping before Pahirath? Well, understanding that Pahirath actually means two mountains. 
So they are traveling, and there are two mountains on each side. So you can't go that way, and you can't go that way. And then he says, and they, they go in camp, so they're going down Pahira and they, between Migdal and the sea. So what happens is there's two mountains, and they're going in between them, so you can't go that way, can't go this way, and the sea is in front of you. But it's no problem because you out of Egypt. I mean, you out of the bondage. I mean, you're away from all of the oppression. I mean, after all, you're free now. I'm just making sure we understand the context here because we need to see something. So God changed their direction, marched them between two great mountains on either side, had them camp with the sea in front of them. Listen to this. God uniquely positions them where there are obstacles everywhere except from the rear. You ever been in a situation where the only way you could go is back? Oh, I'm preaching better. You're saying amen already. I mean, the only way you can go is backwards. But after all, it don't really look like a threat. Verse 3. So, I, I, can I, I'm sorry, I need to interject something in here so you can understand the text. It's very interesting because we're going to take several perspectives when, read it, when we're reading this. If you notice right now, God has been talking to Moses, telling him what to say. Oh, yeah, I don't know if you caught that in the first verse. So, this is a conversation that happened before the children of Israel knew what was going on. God and Moses had a conversation. So God is telling Moses, he says, for Pharaoh, verse 3, will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. It was a setup. Not for Israel, but for Pharaoh. God will position you where your enemy thinks he can win. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. He didn't consult you on that. Oh, come on now. Come on. Oh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm trying to bring you aboard because we're going somewhere. Remember, he turned them. This ain't the way you were going. I got a little something in plan, I, uh, something in mind. I need to turn you. I need to bring you a place that you can't go to the left. You can't go to the right. The only place you go is backwards. Then, by the way, I, I got a little setup going on. I got a little setup. Something going to happen here. Oh, but I don't need you to be privy to it. I just need you to obey me. Verse 4, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, this is a conversation that's still happening, y'all. Do you see this? And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. You know, Egypt is always a type of the world. Whenever you look in scripture, you will always see people going down into Egypt. You go up into Jerusalem, but you go down into Egypt. You always go down when you go in the world. Look at this. Let's read verse 4 again. It's very interesting. So God is hardening Pharaoh's heart. Y'all see that? And he's going to follow after them. So this was already known. This was already laid out. They just didn't know about it. <laughs> Boy, it reminds me a whole lot of Job. See, conversations happen that we don't know about. But God don't need you to, he, he don't need us to approve it. He just needs us to obey it. And he says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. 
So there are some things that God wants the world to know about him. Look what he said, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. I'm doing this so they'll know that I'm God. This ain't about you. Can God use you to teach the world something? Use me, Lord. Can God use you to teach the world something? Yeah, I, I, think, I think I got y'all on board now. I feel like everybody don't point to their car. We good to go now. Verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. Now we get a snapshot into what's happening in Egypt. If you didn't notice, we started off with God talking to Moses about the children of Israel, and we start learning where they were at, where they had moved to, where they had camped. But now in verse 5, we are actually in Egypt hearing what's going on. Did you see the scene change? And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Sometimes the heart of your enemies turn against you because it's necessary to reveal the invisible nature of God. See, glory is the invisible nature of a thing. Sometimes it's necessary for the heart of our enemies to turn against us so it can reveal the invisible nature of God. We want God to get glory, Amen. so we want his invisible nature to be made manifest. Sometimes that takes our enemies' hearts to be turned against us to do that. Now, you, you, you do notice once again, God is not consulting Israel about this. You, you are aware that there's literally actions. See, can, can for a moment, can we just look at something? Israel still camped. They're not privy to what's going on. They're not thinking his heart is against us. They're not thinking they're getting ready to come after us. All they know is we free. Oh, I love him. I absolutely love him. The Bible says in verse 7, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. So when he takes 600 chosen, this is the best chariots he's got. And then he says, and all the chariots. So we didn't just take 600. The very best we have, I want everybody else who got a chariot to come on. And then he says, and the captains over every one of them. Now, before I, I get into this a little bit, I want you to understand, these the, were the most supreme weapons of that time. These, the, the, these, um, th this would have been equivalent to us today knowing that the best uh, of the arsenal that any nation has has been equipped and formed against you. And they are bringing it with the best people possible to operate it. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. See, let's do verse 7 again then. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other folks on foot. Just, just want you to understand. Remember, Israel's just camped. And the little ones, all their babies. I mean, you can only go so fast. You know, you got your cattle. You, you, you know, you got all of this stuff. They got chariots. And they got chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. How many chariots does Egypt have? And captains over every one of them. See, let, let, let's for a moment, let's just stop. See, the enemy seeks to use his most intimidating weapons to bring us back to a place of fear and bondage. What's the most intimidating weapon that the enemy uses against you? Is it disease? We're in a climate and, a, and now People are walking around and everyone's afraid and fearful. Whenever you start thinking about fear, who is that? Who is that? 
because and what I'm saying, and I'm not, I'm not saying don't be cautious. I'm not saying don't be aware. But listen, let me let me share something with you. Viruses, diseases, all of this has always been here. Maybe now God has allowed it to be magnified in a way that we can see who's been protecting us all along. When people say, well, I don't know what to thank God for. Really? In case you're struggling, we ain't always been wearing masks. So sometimes the enemy wants to use his most intimidating weapons. Maybe that's disease for people. Oh, God. You know, some folks are still won't come outside. But why are you living in bondage at home? Whom the son has set free is free indeed. Amen. Well, pastor, you know, you, 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 know, you don't want to tempt God. I don't. But he told me to occupy till he come. And God know what I have to do till he come. And it ain't stay in the house all the time. So maybe disease is not the intimidating factor for you. But what about debt? What about debt? That intimidating thing that robs you of your options. Robs you of your creativity. Well, you know, everybody in debt. So oh, no, 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 everybody ain't in debt. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. It may be a lot of folks in jail, but you don't need to be one of them. Ah, oh, well, you know, I, no, no, no. Listen. Boy, okay. I'm going to tell you something. You want to be positioned for what God, what God is about to do? Get out of debt. I believe we're about to see one of the greatest transfers of wealth that we have ever seen. But you need to be out of debt. Because a lot of people have made a mistake. They were lulled to sleep by watching the things that happened. And they thought that this was the way to go. People are walking around and, well, and I, I know people may, listen, people may get mad when I say this, but I don't care. Well, you know, that's good debt. Listen. Show me good debt in the Bible. Not in our economy, but in the Bible. The goal is don't owe any, don't owe any man anything. That's the goal. The Bible says owe no man anything but the love. Well, pastor, that ain't talking about money. Well, no, it's not. But it says withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it's in the power of your hand to do so. That is talking about money. So let's, let's, let's see, see, listen, the only debt I want to owe is love. Yes. I'm obligated yes. to love. Because yes. whom the son is set free is free indeed. Yes. I want to walk in freedom in every aspect of my life. Yes. The greatest debt you and I ever had was sin and God paid it. So he don't want you indebted to nobody else for anything else. So you want to see a real transfer? Get out. Get out of debt. I know it may seem like, man, I ain't got nothing. Oh, I got to get rid of this. I got to pay that. Do it. You're not going to regret it. You're not going to regret it. Well, maybe that's not the, I know that's maybe not the intimidating thing for you. You say, well, you know, Pastor, I ain't the disease and the debt. I'm all right. What about the discouragement? Have you turned on your TV lately? It is, listen, it is hard not to be discouraged. Somebody's getting shot. Somebody's getting robbed. I, I mean, if you, don't, if you haven't noticed, out west, they're robbing people left and right. They're robbing the stores. Folks are literally going in there, doing this, looking at their watch, saying how long they got before they got to get out. Robbing jewelry stores, Walgreens. They robbed so many Walgreens that they closed them. I'm telling you the truth. Now they robbed the doggone train depot so much, they closing that and moving. So it looks like the pattern is starting that all we got to do is rob and you're going to close stuff. 
And since you're going to close it, why not just rob it anyway? That's some people's mentality. Why aren't we hearing of people being arrested? We're just hearing of robberies. And what companies are doing to protect their bottom line after being robbed. The world is changing. It can be discouraging. Oh, boy. Let's, let's keep reading. So he took 600 chosen chariots, his best. And then he took the rest of the chariots and the captains over every one of them. Wait a minute. So, so when the enemy has his best weapons and that's not enough, what does he do? He adds all that's at his disposal to try and overwhelm you with his most formidable tool. What's his most formidable tool? It's not disease. It's not debt. It's not discouragement. The most formidable tool that the enemy uses, now listen to me, is doubt. Yes. To get you to doubt God. Yes. Let's look at the story now. There's been a discussion. We've seen what's happening in Egypt. We've seen a discussion between God and Moses on what to say to the people. We see these things happening. But now let's watch what transpires. Verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. You know, as we begin to conclude this portion here, it's a thing of beauty as God is delivering you. Think back to your own personal life as God has brought you out of something, yeah. as he's allowed you to experience his deliverance. Yeah. It's a thing of beauty when you start to think about the grasp that the enemy had on you has been loosened. You're now free of his grasp, free of his power over you. It's so gratifying when you realize you are finally free. It's so gratifying that you can even become a little defiant when you're winning. I, I need to read verse 8 so you can understand how this really transpires. The Bible says the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay? While we're dealing with Pharaoh's heart, something else is happening. It says... And he pursued after the children of Israel. So if you notice, our scene has changed. Because remember, in real time, the children of Israel are camped. But what God has done is took us behind the scenes on what happened before they marched out. We now see that there was some hard things going on with Pharaoh. Oh, my goodness. I feel the Holy Ghost. We now see that there were some things transpiring behind the scenes. What do you mean? The Bible says the children of Israel went out with a high hand. In other words, the deliverance took place and it was so awesome that they became bold with it. They, they became, we out of here. This is it. We go. 430 years of bondage is over. I don't care what Pharaoh says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were defiant. They felt real good about themselves. Come on now, how you feel when God deliver you? What a devil at? Where is he at? Why you, come on now, how do you feel? You feel a little defiant. God working on your behalf. You begin to see him manifest. Oh yeah, it's on now, devil. Yeah, you feeling good. I just wanted to make sure you were in context here. Okay. See if you can see how the children of Israel felt. The Bible says they came out with a high hand. We somebody now. Slave who? Yeah, we, 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 got, we got it going on. God is with us. Let's go to verse 9. But, that amazing, that's the way verse 9 start off. We ended with a defiant hand. We were standing like, your, like, like, like brothers on the podium. We had a defiant hand. But. We start off with, but, but the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pahiroth before Bel 
Zephon. So wait a minute. If you notice, the story has come full circle. It takes us back to verses 1 and 2. It has showed us what is transpiring behind the scenes. It has showed us the things that was going on behind the curtain. It has showed us the attitudes and the heart workings that were going down and the people weren't aware. Are you with me now? So now we're back to the place that they're between two mountains with the sea in front of them. Ain't nowhere to go but backwards. But all of a sudden, the one way that you could go is now filled up with Egyptians that are pursuing you with all their horses and their chariots. So now they've been overtaken between two mountains with the sea in front and the only exit now being overrun by the enemy that they were defiant with. You didn't just come out saying, yeah, oh, yes, sir, master. Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me go. No, no, it wasn't like that. No, you were defiant. You were saying some stuff. He's running your mouth. Oh, yeah, 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 wait a minute. I mean, we, we, I mean you know, you was talk, we was talking a good game. God was on our side. Just want to make sure we understand. Verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, getting close now, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid with their defiant self. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So, so wait a minute. They were far enough away to see their enemy coming, but unable to go anywhere. Remember, they boxed in, but they see the enemy coming. What does that feel like? Most intimidating weapons that the enemy has, and he's bringing them after you now. Can't go to the left. Can't go to the right. Can't go to the front. The only way you could go was backwards, and now here you're coming that way. What's that look like? What's that feel like? And you were defiant. I mean, you were nasty when you got delivered. You said some stuff. You were talking bold. Now here he come. You watching him come. You can see it. The Bible says, I mean, according to the text, they were so afraid. They weren't just scared. They were really scared. They knew what is, they, I mean, come, come wait a minute, just for a second. They seen for 430 years what Israel, I mean, what, what Egypt does with chariots. They've seen Egypt rule the entire world. And now here's all of this coming after some people that ain't even got weapons. Folks that don't even know how to fight. We were slaves a few days ago. We're just trying to obey God. And you mean to tell me we got to deal with all of this? After all, we're being obedient. God, the one who turned us this way. I thought we was going the right way. I thought we was on our way somewhere. Now here where I can't go frontwards. Can't go to the either side. Kept in the back of my mind, the escape route was backwards. Now here they come. I want to make sure we understand this because... If, if you haven't followed me yet, I'm letting you know that God will take you to a place that you can't get out of. No, no, you didn't get that by accident. He literally took you there, told you to turn. Put stuff in front of you where you can't go forward. It's on the side of you where you can't, you can't even, if you wanted to, you can't climb this mountain. Yeah. And the Bible says, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Man, that's awesome, ain't it? They cried to God for deliverance. Lord, help us. So when they saw their current predicament, they became afraid. They cried to God. Hallelujah. Now, we, we know that's going to be awesome. They cried to God. Verse 11. And they said unto Moses. So they cried to God and started talking about Moses. They don't sound like saints. Just saying, uh, you know, a whole lot ain't changed. And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away 
to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Now, now, now just, you know, I was kind of thinking about this. You know, you didn't have to go. I mean, you could have stayed. You so happy eating your garlics and leeks, you could have stayed. You know, some people that's on the bandwagon until a crisis comes. Long as it's all right, they all right. But soon as something spring up, soon as it look like they ain't going to get what they want. So let's look at this. The Bible talks about they cried unto the Lord in verse 10. So they cried unto the Lord, but they didn't wait for a response from God. They immediately blamed their leader. I'm just stating what's in the book. See, when a crisis arises, it's easy to forget that the journey is not the destination. No, let me say it again because you may miss what I'm saying. When a crisis arises, it's easy to forget that the journey is not the destination. God never told them we're going out to the wilderness to have a wonderful time. He says, I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. So the destination was a land flowing with milk and honey. So why are you panicking simply because we're in the wilderness? Obviously, we're not going to remain here. See, that, that just, we, we, we start to think that the journey is the destination. The wilderness is just part of the journey. And because they thought the wilderness was the destination, they started to blame Moses. Because you, you, there wasn't no graves in Egypt, you brought us out here to die? Really? That's the best you got? Yeah, I just want to make sure we understand. See, the destination was always the promised land. It was never the wilderness. Verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? It's always some folks who want to go back. We told you, leave us alone, Moses. We good right here. That whip ain't that bad. <laughs> Say, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Listen to this. An excuse to quit is always easy to find, especially during a crisis. An excuse to quit is always easy to find, especially during a crisis. We told you it was going to be like this, Moses. Now, now you, you, you know the truth of the matter. It's folks that mumble and talk and say stuff behind closed doors and, you know, but, but I, I thought you was on board. I, I thought you was with this. The, the last time I looked, when I was reading this, there's some folks that's out here in the same place that Moses is. Now, if it was so good in Egypt, why, why, why you ain't still there? I mean, you know, you could have stayed. I mean, God didn't rope nobody and bring and drag them up out of there. I want to share something else. The Bible says that is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt. Let us alone so we can serve the Egyptians. Let us alone so we can stay in bondage. Let us alone so we can stay saved, slaves. For it had been better for us to serve or be slaves than that we should die in the wilderness. Adversity reveals the content of one's character. See, people don't like trouble, but listen, adversity will reveal what's in you. What's really on the inside of you? A lot of times you're not going to know until you really hit some trouble. Right. Proverbs 24 and 10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Because adversity reveals the content of one's character. 
Everybody look good when things are smooth. Amen. Talking a good game. What happens when the adversity hit? What happens when it looks like you, 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 you're not going to make it? What's your default then? Verse 13. This is actually my text I was trying to get to. We just had to cover some ground so we'd be contextually accurate. So after all of this is going on, after all of this complaining, all of this criticism, after us being stuck with nowhere to go on the side, on either side of us, can't go behind us now because that's blocked by an enemy that's coming to get us, can't go forward because it's a sea out there. What does Moses finally say? What does, what's going to happen with all of this? What are we going to do with this whole situation? So Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. I got a few minutes. Let me work with this a little bit. First thing that Moses said, stop being afraid. Psalms 27 and 1 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Listen, stop being afraid. I speak to you in the midst of a pandemic. Stop being afraid. I speak to you in the midst of, of, of the fact that you cannot go to the left without being in the pandemic. You cannot go to the right without being in the pandemic. You cannot go forward without being in the pandemic. And you can't go back before it started. Stop being afraid. Yeah, and you thought we were talking about the children of Israel. So he says, stop being afraid. Then the next thing he says is, stand still. Stop fretting and trying to figure everything out. Why are you wasting mental energy on stuff that doesn't matter? Well, what's going to happen with my retirement now? Really? You got that on your mind in the midst of all of this? If you haven't gathered by now, everything is changing. I'll tell you where to focus your mental energies. God, what do you want me to do? Because that's the way you're going to prosper. And if he don't answer you soon enough, don't jump on the leap. Don't do that. Stand still. See, some people are just, they're fretting. Uh, oh, I don't want to do. Uh, uh. Yeah, have you ever seen somebody that was really nervous? You know, I, I, I know this might be bad, but the, the, they used to have these old, old, them old movies, old black and white movies. They would have people who would panic. Male, male, male or female, I'm just saying old movies, these are old, old movies. And you look at some of them, this was, this was one of the characteristics of that day and time. There would be somebody that would panic, and, oh, they were all fretting. And you know what somebody would do? Slap him. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no, no. And I'm not telling you to hit nobody. That ain't what I'm saying. That ain't what I'm saying. What would happen after that? The person would be still. Because that's what's happening with people. They are fretting. They're jumping around from this thing to that thing, trying to find out what to do. They just be still. Just be still. If you don't, you're going to miss what's happening. So Moses tells them, don't be afraid. He says, stand still. Stop fretting. Why are you responding to all of the external stimuli? Why? What's really changed for you? God's still on the throne. What's really changed for you? Be still. 
Because you see this enemy now. So can, I, can I share something with you? I want you to go back in time with me for a moment. We started off in verses 1 and 2 with them in a camp. They just couldn't go to the left. They couldn't go to the right. They had a sea in front of them. They couldn't go forward. They were just camping. The only thing changed is they saw an enemy coming. See how we can be? They didn't even move in their location. It wasn't that the environment got real bad. They just saw an enemy coming. So now Moses says, listen, I, I, I need you to stop being afraid. I need you to stand still. Stop fretting. Stop jumping all around, acting crazy. Look like a chicken with his head cut off. Relax. Look at this. You know, I, I, sometimes we try to figure everything out, and that's what makes it, because we can't figure out what's happening and what's going to happen. Yeah. Psalms 46 and 10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. So he says, stop being afraid. Stand still or stop fretting. Try to figure everything out. And he says something here. Look at this. And see the salvation of the Lord. See the salvation of the Lord. See the salvation of the Lord. You know why people can't see God moving? They ain't standing still. Too much. Too afraid. Jumping all around. Stand still and you can see. You can't see when you ain't still. So God wants you not be afraid. Don't want you fretting. He wants you to be able to see what he's doing. Did you hear that? Okay. I don't think you heard it. I think you heard it, but you didn't hear it. See the salvation of the Lord. Psalms 118 and 23 says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Why don't we decide to get still so we can see what God is doing and how marvelous it is in our eyes? This has been some of the best times in my life. In the midst of the pandemic. Oh, let, let, let me preach to some of you all a little bit because if the truth be told, some of y'all don't come out of debt in the midst of the pandemic. Some of you all don't made more money than you don't ever had in the midst of the pandemic. You don't change zip codes in the midst of the pandemic. You don't bought new cars in the midst of the pandemic. You don't heard God answer your prayers in the midst of the pandemic. But you had to stand still. You had to stand still. Oh, let's go back and look. You had to stand still. You, you, you couldn't be running all around. You had to stand still. You had to let God show you some stuff in the midst of this. Makes me almost want to step back and wonder a little bit. God, did we all need to stand still? Was that really what the problem was? We were all so busy, occupied with the plans of life, the desires for success, that all of a sudden God had to shut it all down and say, I need you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I need to show you a little something. Pastor, are you saying that God caused the pandemic? No, I'm going to tell you straight up, sin is the cause of the pandemic. You could go and work all of this and you could talk about Wuhan and where it all comes. It's sin. It is sin. Because if we were doing right, all this stuff wouldn't be here. It's going to get some folks' attention. Aren't you ever, uh, can we just for a moment, just for a moment, aren't you uh, amazed that a virus, a virus, has shut down the globe. The globe. No matter how much money you make, no matter what's on the end of your name or in front of your name, whether you were elected, appointed, or just there, 
a virus has changed everybody's life. And that's just one thing. I, I, I'm always amazed because it's the simple things that people cannot handle. It wasn't a, a, a colossus, you know, we think of stuff like, what if World War III break out? And all? No, it's just a virus. And folk running scared of a virus. Now, like I said I, before, I'm not saying not to be cautious. I, 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 that's not what I'm saying. The Bible says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord, and I don't. Wear my mask just like you do. But I, here's the thing. Why are people panicking because of something that we can't control? Is it because you see the enemy coming? You now know there's a virus in the land? You do realize this has always been here. So let's do this, move on so I can finish this last portion here. Um, so it says, which he will show you today. He says, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, your enemy, you shall see them again no more forever. So God can make what you've been afraid of all your life disappear in a moment. No, 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 no. God can make what you have been afraid of all your life, 430 years, you don't have to deal with these Egyptians. They don't rule the entire known world. And Moses is telling you today, the enemy that you see, you will see no more forever. I'm going to make disappear what you have been afraid of all your life today. He's a mighty big God. He's a mighty big God. See, these are things that change your perspective on stuff. These are things that all of a sudden you say, no, God is awesome. Because you begin to realize he's bigger than all your enemies. Even the ones you've always been afraid of. Well, I know people don't like to talk about that kind of stuff. I got it. I, well, you know, Pastor, you know, God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Yeah, I know we love to say that kind of stuff, and that's in the text. That is, that, listen, that is scriptural. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but that don't mean that you ain't afraid. He just said he didn't give it to you. <laughs> let, let, let me help you. See, I believe you need to get the whole counsel on stuff. Psalms See, for those folks that's feeling a little funny, Psalms 34 and 4. Because you know some people, I ain't scared of nothing. You know, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Psalms 34 and 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Yeah, I had some. He delivered me from all of them. Just seek him. Just seek him. Verse 14, and I'm really going to wrap this up now. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. I need to share a little something to you, something with you. The Bible says that God turned them, remember? They were marching a certain way, and God turned them and brought them into this place where there's Seemingly no escape. The path that they were going on would have been a shorter path to the promised land. But if you flip back over in Exodus chapter 13, God lets you know why he didn't take them that way. Because Israel had never fought. They didn't know what it was like to be in battle. They didn't know what it was like to be engaged in warfare. They were slaves for 430 years. They've never learned the art of war. And if God said, if I take them that way, perhaps they would be faced with battle 
and would turn and go back into Egypt. So let me turn them. Let me bring them into a place that they can't get out of. They can't go forward. They can't go to the left. They go, can't go to the right. And behind them, I'm going to allow their enemies to come. So I can show them that I can destroy their enemies. I'm just not going to tell them all of this up front. So let me help you. He's not just going to tell you that up front. It's developing your trust in God. So just because you see the enemy coming, that don't mean nothing. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. People love to use this scripture. The God is going to fight my battle. Listen, when you look at God, the reason he was fighting their battle is because they weren't ready yet. Later on, you find out there's a young man by the name of Joshua in the midst of this. Every time Joshua hears something, he says, sound like water to me. Joshua always ready to throw down. But the rest of Israel didn't have that testimony. It was still some folks that was on the soft side. They read to run back to Egypt. They're ready to go back into the world. They're ready to go back into bondage. Because after all, it's easier to be in bondage than it is to learn how to fight. Oh, I'm preaching better you saying amen. Because there's some folks who would rather be in bondage than learn how to fight. He teaches my hands to fight and my fingers to war. He'll teach you how, but it's just easier to go back into bondage. It's just easier, pastor, to just to lay down. And let the enemy have his way. And let, instead of letting him teach me, yeah, teach me. letting him teach me, well, 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 can I just call the intercessors? No, he, no, no, no. Let me help you. He's going to put you in a place where you can't go forward, you can't go to the left, you can't go to the right, and the intercessors can't get there. Because he's going to teach your hands to war and your fingers to fight. It was just not then. So, so when you start quoting all these scriptures, the Lord's going to fight your battle. Wait a minute. What does that say about you? Does it say you're not ready? I just want us to understand because I, I, I've heard say, well, you're the Lord. Why is he fighting? I, there, there is a place where God is fighting for us. I understand. And you ain't never fighting the devil anyway. That ain't your fight to have. Your real fight right. is with you. Yes. Amen. It ain't even other people. Okay, when you want to slap somebody, where's the fight at? It's you. Are you going to obey God or your flesh? Here's the war. What we going to do? The war is on. Can I show you something? The Lord shall fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. So, wait, wait a minute, y'all, y'all, wait, wait a minute. I know y'all, y'all are rolling. Y'all, see, y'all don't got this. You, you got the concept. So the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Wait a minute. So God's gonna fight, but we need to hold our peace. I remember growing up as a, a little boy and the old folks would say, hold your peace. And then I remember another phrase. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. That's the problem. People don't want to hold their peace. They want to give it away. <laughs> and the way you give your peace away is opening your mouth. See, the world, well, I, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me get back to my text. Let me get back to my text. So the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So now watch this. So you need to be still to see that the Lord is fighting for you. Yeah. Need to be still. To see, that, see, if you're jumping around and all of this, you can't see who's fighting for you. 
Now, let's talk about, since, 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 you know, today we are talking about the advantages of being still in the kingdom. So, being still provides you the advantage of being positioned so you can observe what God is doing, not what your enemy is doing. No, you missed it. Oh, you missed it. Being still provides you the opportunity or the advantage of being positioned so you can see what God is doing, not what your enemies are doing. Remember, they were camped. Everything was good. They were camped. Because God was the one who led them there to camp. But they saw what their enemy was doing. See, when you get still, it positions you and gives you the advantage to see what God is doing. Not what your enemy. We, why is everybody, the devil is out. Why does everybody know what the devil is doing and have no clue on what God's doing? Because they're not still. They're not still. The devil chasing me. Why? Turn around and deal with it. Come on. What's the problem? And notice he's still behind you. See, when you still, it positions you to see what God is doing, not what your enemy's doing. That's the advantage of being still in the kingdom. God, what are you doing? Let me just be still so I can see what you're doing. I know all this other stuff happening around me, but Lord, what are you doing? So we're talking about how he's fighting our battles. But look, look, now, wait a minute now. It may require you to be positioned with no other way out. See, notice, no, watch this. When God talks to you about prayer, he says, go into your prayer closet. Watch this. And what does he say after that? Shut the door. No other way out. Amen. I want everything else out there, and I want you in here. Ain't nothing coming in, and you ain't getting out. See, God, oh, my goodness. Look at this. Look at this. It requires us. This, this, this is about to be good. It may require us to be positioned with no other way out. See, being still provides you with the advantage of knowing that there is no other way out but God. Let me, being still provides us with the advantage of knowing that there is no other way out but God. John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way. You're looking for a way out. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus tells you who the way is. It's him. Yes. It ain't because, oh, well, you know, we can't go over this mountain. We can't go through this sea. We can't run this. No, no. He is the way. Listen to this. Oh, th this, this was good to me. God doesn't need an exit because he's everywhere. That was good to me. What am I saying? God doesn't need an exit. See, Israel didn't have an exit. But God don't need one because he's everywhere. If you're everywhere, why you need an exit? We're looking for exits in life. How to get out of this. How to get out of that. How to, oh, God, bring us out. He's everywhere. He don't need an exit. I have to put that in my notes. It's one of them I got to add. <laughs> it may require you to hold your peace so your mouth won't abort the perfect place for victory. He says, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Don't let your mouth abort the perfect place for victory. So you surround it. So you can't go forward. So you can't go. Don't abort it with your mouth. Don't abort the perfect place for victory. Amen. Wow. Amen. Good what do you mean? Being still provides you with the advantage of not always saying what you feel. Amen. 
Who says you have to say what you feel? Who made that rule? You walk by faith, not by what you see or what you feel. Who says you have to say what you feel? I, I know you need some Bible, no problem. Isaiah 35 and 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. He will come and save you. I ain't got to say what I feel. I say what I believe. <laughs> Hebrews 13 and 6 says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. See, it's the advantages of being still in the kingdom. I'm positioned to see what God is doing. I'm not opening my mouth to abort the perfect place of victory. So I'm being still. God's doing some things here. I'm being still. I ain't running all around fretting it and jumping and all trying to figure this out. Oh, no, 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 no. It, it may look like ain't no other way out. But God don't need an exit. I ain't struggling with that. Jesus show up when doors are closed. He don't need an exit. So why are we looking for exits instead of looking for God? My word to you today, experience the advantage of being still in the kingdom. Don't fret. Don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Just be still. God's got this. Every one of us stood in January of 2020, not knowing that life was about to change. But it never took God by surprise. We had our normal January through December plans, and they all changed. Seemingly overnight, when you look back. But it never changed from God being on the throne. Never Watch this. I, I, do you? I found this out, Deacon Mark. My prayers still made it to the throne. Can you believe that? In the midst of a pandemic. My point is, Things may change that we see, but the eternal things really don't change. God is still God. He's still working on your behalf right now. Right now, when you don't even know what's going on, God is working on your behalf. Right now, when you may look like things are not going to work out for you, don't look like you're going to get past this point, God is working on your behalf. Sure, he may not be consulting you with all of the details. But you know what? That's because he's sovereign. That's because he's Lord. That's because you really gave him your life. At least that's what you said. So stop fretting. Fear not. Don't be afraid no more. Stand still. This is your time to observe the wondrous works of God. See God doing things in your life. Well, Lord, what about this? We, you know what? God does one thing, and we start thinking about the next thing. Why don't you be still? Why don't you cater yourself to the things that please God now? Exhaust those things. And before you know it, not only are you out, but you out and so much further than you ever thought you would be because God was working all the time anyway. Let me share this and I'm going to get ready to close. I honestly believe that we have entered into a time 
where God is raising up an army of people. And when I say an army of people, this is not just here. This is abroad. This is across the globe. But as people, here is, here is the number one key, I believe. It's your ability to follow instructions. It's not because of what you see, not because of what you think. Follow instructions. I believe that there's going to be connections that will be made that you have absolutely no idea that they were going to transpire. But you will find yourself being in a place and the place will be where God is making the connection. All you did was be obedient to get there. That's why it's so important to follow the instructions now. Don't worry about, well, this, uh, see, if we, if we are so caught up in us, we miss instructions. Specifically, simple instructions. Simple ones. Whatever, whenever God gives us something, it will always be something we can do. He's never going to ask you to do something you're incapable of doing. If he asks you to do it, you're capable of doing it. Follow the instructions. Remember those words. Because I promise you, this is a season it will make all the difference in your life. People have found ways to skirt around stuff, working things. It won't happen anymore. The Lord this morning, I, I, I'll close with this. I was in prayer and I felt impressed on this. People know about the principles of God and the promises of God. The principles of God are things like you find individuals who are not saved, but they tithe. You, 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 the principles of God are things like treat everybody right. Use the golden rule. Those are principles. And they work. The promises of God. God made certain promises. And all his promises are yea and amen. His promises will come to pass. Whatever God said and he promised it, it will come to pass. But there's the other thing called the purpose of God. The purpose of God trumps the promises of God. The purpose of God trumps the principles of God. In other words, God had the principles and God had the promises, but God had the purpose. What did God purpose you to do? What did God purpose you to become? He purposed you to become like Christ. So whether you get what was promised, because sometimes we can do things that default the promises. Whether you use the principles See, sometimes the principles, people are using them to get what they want. But the purpose, there's a purpose on the inside of you that God purposed from all eternity. So instead of just trying to manipulate and do principles and claim promises, why don't we pursue the purpose? God, what do you really desire? What do you really want out of my life? Because if you can find the purpose, I promise you it won't be a problem dealing with promises or principles. Because purpose is going to always trump promises and principles. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray for those that are under the sound of my voice. That we would learn to be still. And experience the advantages of your kingdom. God, there are people who are hearing me today who need to know the importance of not being afraid, standing still, and seeing you work in their lives. God, there are people today who are fretting, they're dealing with things in their bodies, anxieties and stresses that are breaking out and creating literally physical maladies in their bodies right now because, Lord, they've not learned to be still. They're trying to control so many different things in a world that's moving and shaking in all kinds of different directions. And they need to know to be still. God, you said simply stand still. Stop fretting. Don't find yourself obligated to all of these different things and committed to so much. But find yourself in a position where you can see God moving. To observe the wondrous works of our God. Father, I pray for those that don't know you. Lord, they're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They're hearing so much out there. 
But I pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ would penetrate their hearts and minds, that they would see the necessity of confessing with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in their heart that, Father, you raised him from the dead, that they shall be saved. I pray for that kind of gospel being preached, not one that's catering to the principles only and the promises and not understanding the purpose that they were called to be with you, Lord. They'd be in a relationship with you. You said it eloquently when you named or gave Jesus the name Emmanuel, God with us. There's a goal, there's a purpose you have for us, your people. And may we recognize it. Not about being religious, but it's about having a relationship. Not about an organization that we're part of, but Lord, it's about belonging to the family of our God. And we only get the belonging in this family by birth. You must be born again. Father, I thank you. And I pray that the truth of the word of God will shatter every wall that has kept people from coming to know Jesus Christ. I thank you and I honor you in Christ's name. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. God bless you all. Thank you for taking this time to be with us on today. I pray that this word has encouraged you and ministered to you. And be still. Find the opportunity to be still in life. Don't allow circumstances and situations to push you all around, but stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God bless you. Hello. Thank you for taking the opportunity to tune in with us on today. I believe it's a tremendous blessing to be able to hear and receive from the word of God. I want to take an opportunity also to challenge you as you move further in not just hearing, but obeying the word of God. The Bible speaks in Romans of the fact that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, it doesn't stop there. It also lets us know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then it leads us further to let us know that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to meet the Savior today. An opportunity to meet Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the one who died for our sins, who was buried and who was raised again from the dead. Today, you can know him personally. I want you to take this opportunity to pray with me. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I know that you are the son of the living God. And I believe that you gave your life for me. Come into my life. Come into my heart. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I thank you now for saving me. Amen and amen. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer, you've just accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You are now part of the family of God. Your life has been changed forever. I want to encourage you now to be a part of a Bible-believing church, somewhere where you can be fed the Word of God. The Bible says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's important that you're hearing from God. It's important that you're growing in God's grace. I want to encourage you, find a place that you can connect with other like-minded believers and grow in the things of God. It will make all the difference in your new life as you live as unto the Lord. Also want to encourage those that may be watching now and maybe you're already saved. Maybe you're already part of a, a, a church and you're just wanting to find somewhere where you can continue to grow in the things of God and add or supplement your faith. Thank you for taking this opportunity and allowing us to be a part of that supplement. Also, I want to say this. Some of you all may be watching and you say, well, how can I give to that ministry? How can I sow into that ministry? Well, listen, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity. We have an app that you can actually uh, download to your phone and you can give to this ministry at any time that you want to. Or feel free to go to our website. 
You can go to our website and on our website, you will find uh, an opportunity to donate. There's a donate button. Click on that button and it will further direct you into being able to give into this ministry. Listen, I believe that giving is a gain and not a loss. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible lets us know that he increases the fruits of our righteousness. When we give, the Bible lets us know that he causes us to increase. He increases the fruits of our righteousness. It's all because God has allowed us to partake in the work that he is doing in the earth. And that is giving. That is giving of his son unto us. So when we give, we have an opportunity to imitate what God has been doing for us all along. Because it wasn't that we deserved it. It was that God was so good that he was giving his own son on our behalf. I pray that the message has been a blessing to you. And I encourage you to come out, be a part of what we're doing. We're located at 740 North Main Street here in High Point, North Carolina. Feel free to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. or every Wednesday evening at 720 p.m. God bless you and thank you again for being with us. God bless.